of the MSTP program here at Case Western Reserve University, where she received her MD and PhD. She completed her residency training in internal medicine at UH Case Medical Center, where she also completed her ID fellowship. She is an assistant professor at CWRU and is an ID physician at the Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center. She's known for her work with the Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center at the VA. Her research interests include colonization resistance in older adults. Today, she'll be discussing probiotics in patients with gut infections. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jump. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, and let me thank Dr. Armitage for inviting me to give this talk here today. So my disclosures, as well as a disclaimer, which is that the opinions here are my own and not those of the federal government or the Veterans Affairs System, though if they like them, they'd be happy to adopt them. Learning objectives, there's three, as is traditional. Um, the first is to provide a brief overview of probiotics. The second is to discuss potential clinical use of probiotics in adult patients with GI infections. And I'm choosing a very narrow focus here on purpose. There's a myriad of probiotic literature that addresses inflammatory bowel disease, which is definitely not my area of expertise. So we're going to focus on adults with infections in the gut. And finally, we'll describe the current use, or to discuss the current use of omics technology as a means to understand the gut microbiome and as a means to think about how we can actually advance probiotic um, investigations. So to start off with, what are probiotics? They're live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. And this is a definition by the Joint Food and Agriculture Organization and the WHO Working Group. According to experts in the field, a successful probiotic must be ingested in an active or live form it needs to colonize the gut rather than pass through, and it is also supposed to attach and adhere to the lining of the GI tract. Except that we have probiotics that don't do this, um, that either don't colonize, they just do pass on through, but still may have a, a healthy effect, and they certainly don't attach and adhere. So even among experts, the only point that's really agreed on is that they have to be ingested in an alive, in an active form. How do probiotics work? It's not entirely clear. There's a lot of hand-waving that goes on to try to discuss potential mechanisms. There's speculation that the probiotics are able to modify the immune response that's mediated by the host epithelial tissue. There's speculation that, it may act, that probiotics may modify the metabolic responses by other gut bacteria or by the host itself. I don't think we have a lot of evidence to say one way or the other what the actual mechanisms are. There's also the potential and the likely reality that probiotics may occupy a niche that prevents pathogens from gaining a foothold, though we don't really have direct evidence of this as of yet. And there's also the idea that probiotics may promote colonization resistance. And this is a model for colonization resistance, and this is an area where I do my research. The idea is that we start off, uh, most of us that are healthy, with a nice, nice and healthy, robust gut microbiome, very diverse, lots of bacteria. Something happens and we're exposed to systemic antimicrobials, which disrupts the gut microbiome, wiping it out. And then after the antibiotics are done, the gut microbiome eventually recovers to become, to establish a new baseline of richness and diversity of the gut microflora. This baseline here is different from what people started with as well. And during this time of recovery, we're vulnerable to enteric pathogens, C. diff, of course, being the most notorious. And somewhere in here, there's also a transition to where the healthy gut is able to reestablish colonization resistance. We don't know when this transition takes place, and we also don't know which bacteria are responsible for that tra transition. The idea is that probiotics might be able to um, ameliorate some of the effects of disrupting the, the, the gut microbiome by host antibiotics. I'm sorry. Probiotics may mitigate the effects of antibiotics on the gut microbiome, so it's not quite as wiped out, and it also may hasten the recovery of the gut microbiota. So some specific probiotic organisms. The most famous is Lactobacillus rhamnosus strain GG. And note here that we have genus, species, and strain. It's pictured here. Strain GG comes from Golden and Gorbach. Um, these are the original physicians that isolated this particular strain and studied it and also submitted it to the ATCC so that we can all examine it if we want to. 
And the reason why they focused on lactobacillus rhamnosus is because it is resistant not only to stomach acid, but also to bile salts. So it actually does get into the gut and survives all of our other um, defense mechanisms on the way there. Two other bacteria that are commonly used as probiotics are lactobacillus acidophilus and casei, and these are involved in making yogurt and in cheeses, and like it or not, we actually ingest them on a regular basis if we're eating yogurt or hard cheeses like cheddar cheese. Two other common antimicrobial, or anti, excuse me, probiotics are lactobacillus ruteri and bifidobacterium species, a wide variety of bifidobacterium species, these are selected as probiotic agents because they're supposed to be universal colonizers of at least mammalian guts. Why that becomes a rationale to say that it's part of a healthy gut microbiome, I'm not entirely clear because we really don't know what a healthy gut microbiome is at this point, other than it seems to be that someone who does not have diarrhea, but it's different for all of us. And finally, representing the non-bacterial species is Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast, and this is considered to be either a subspecies or a distinct species from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Regardless of how you classify it, it's very closely related to baker's yeast, which we are also quite familiar with in beer and in bread. And this was discovered by a scientist named Bullard around the turn of the last century when he was studying cholera epidemics in the South Pacific. And he noted that the natives of the islands where he was doing his work uh, we're eating the skins of either mangosteens or lychee fruit as a way to mitigate the effects of cholera. It was somewhat successful, and he was actually able to isolate the Saccharomyces strain from that, which eventually became to be called Bayardae, and is now being used as a probiotic. So this is a picture of um, Dr. Gorbach, who's the uh, editor-in-chief of Clinical Infectious Diseases, and also the original one of the original isolators of lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. And he wrote an editorial on CID in 2008 that the clinical uses of probiotics are broad. However, the clinical indications based on evidence-based practices are much narrower. So I'm sorry, it looks like we had a little bit of glitch here. So in general, uh, probiotics are classified as generally regarded as safe, which is a description for food additives by the FDA. In Finland, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG was introduced in 1990, and between the years of 1990 and 2000, per capita consumption rose from one to six liters per year of Lactobacillus rhamnosus, but bacteremia did not. So in general, Lactobacillus rhamnosus at least is safe and tolerated in, in a large population. And in general, when we do see illnesses due to probiotics, it occurs in those that are immunocompromised, critically ill, or those with central lines, and I'll actually address that later on in the talk. So let's talk about what probiotics are not. They are not drugs. They are not FDA-approved medications. They are not standardized. They are not described, for the most part, using scientific nomenclature, lactobacillus rhamnosus GG being a, a clear exception to that. They are not subject to manufacturing or labeling standards about the maximum or minimum number of bacteria that you might actually find in the preparation. And they're not regulated regarding pre-market claims of efficacy or safety because they're usually sold as a food supplement. In fact, they're almost always sold as, sold as a food supplement. So if you're the manufacturer of a probiotic, it's a lot easier to get your food supplement through the FDA approval process and get it on the shelf at Whole Foods or Nature's Bin or Earth Fair or wherever and start making money than it is to actually design a clinical trial to get this through as a new investigative, a new investigatory drug and proceed that way in terms of actually getting your probiotic to be approved for medical utilization. And this has led in part, I think, to also um, a lack of well-designed clinical trials that look at probiotics which is where we're heading next, the actual data support use in the clinical setting. So these are some specific infectious syndromes, and this is what we're going to focus on. Um, so when I looked at probiotics in PubMed, there are almost 8,000 articles. When I looked at probiotics in some specific infectious syndromes, for antibiotic-associated diarrhea, there's a total of about 2,500 articles, nearly 10% of which discuss probiotics. For C. difficile infection, there's nearly 7,000 articles, 3.5% address probiotics. For traveler's diarrhea, there's about 2.7% that are specific to probiotics. And acute pancreatitis, of which there's a whole lot of articles, 
a very few proportion of which um, talk about probiotics, but those are pretty critical ones that I want to share with you today. So a note about the literature and what I actually looked up. Um, I tried to, spick, to stick to double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trials, because this is one of our strongest bits of evidence that we have. Even to an ID physician, the numbers that they use in their probiotic literature are very small numbers. Um, so it's a, it's a caveat to how we interpret these data. Also, I try to look at meta-analyses because that's our best line of evidence to support the use or, or not use of uh, different therapies. And some of the problems with these is that we're looking at different bacteria or different combinations of bacteria combined into one meta-analysis. The bacteria are not always well-defined or well-identified. The treatment protocols vary in terms of the length of time during which people are exposed to the probiotic and how long they're followed up afterward, as well as the number of organisms. And the populations themselves vary. They can be, they have children or adults in the same paper. It may or may not include elderly patients. It may or, it does, it, they generally exclude immunocompromised patients, but the criteria for what's immunocompromised are rarely actually explained. So I really don't know what that means, whether it means someone who's on steroids or someone who's really on immunosuppressive therapy like a cancer patient. So just to put this in perspective, imagine comparing for, in a meta-analysis a, a series of clinical trials in which hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, metoprolol, calcium channel blockers, and then different combinations of those drugs in different proportions are given to a population for the measurement of can we decrease blood pressure and prevent stroke. We would never accept that kind of data for high blood pressure or stroke <coughs> literature, but this is what we're forced to look at for probiotic literature. So these are not ideal studies, but I think people are doing the best they can with what's out there. So we'll start off with traveler's diarrhea as a specific infectious syndrome. This is a map I pulled from the CDC that shows the risk areas for traveler's diarrhea, red being the highest risk, yellow being intermediate, and green being the lowest risk areas. There's about 12 million cases of traveler's diarrhea per year, and the symptoms last two to six days and involve diarrhea, cramps, and nausea. It's the most common non-combat illness among military troops who are on short-term missions, and it's about 29% of those folks that are affected. And in general, when people get traveler's diarrhea, it's because they're healthy enough to travel, which means that they're mostly a healthy population. So there's a meta-analysis looking at the use of probiotics for people as a, as a means to prevent traveler's diarrhea. And we'll start here on the bottom portion. In general, the meta-analysis found that there was an overall favoring of probiotics to prevent traveler's diarrhea, but we're looking really at a mix of different um, combinations of bacteria that were used in the probiotic formulations, including lactobacillus GG here, as well as here. This being one of the larger trials that actually showed efficacy for um, probiotics to prevent traverse diarrhea. But really the preponderance of evidence comes from one group and two studies where they looked at Saccharomyces boulardii as a means to prevent traverse diarrhea. And it did show success, but this hasn't been replicated outside of that group. So I think there's also some limitations to interpreting this data as well. I think there's the potential for Saccharomyces boulardii to be an effective preventative for traveler's diarrhea. And you know, I'll just leave it at that. It's probably safer. So let's move on to antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Uh, this is not my kid, but I have to tell you, it's very hard to get tactful pictures um, to, to give a talk like this. So in a meta-analysis looking at 16 randomized control trials in adult population, seven or 44% of those trials showed efficacy using probiotics to treat antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Among those, only lactobacillus rhamnosus GG and Saccharomyces boulardii show reductions in the recurrence of C. difficile infection, and I'll address those in a couple more slides. And there was actually no comment on excluding immunocompromised patients, but I imagine that for the most part they were. There's one particular trial that I want to highlight for you. It's a randomized control trial for antibiotic-associated diarrhea in which they compared a low-dose and a high-dose probiotic with a placebo in a three-arm study. And they used lactobacillus acidophilus strain CL1285 in combination with lactobacillus casei, 
LBC ADR. I don't know what those strains are, but I'm glad that we actually do have strain identification. They included hospitalized patients ages 50 to 70 who were receiving penicillins, cephalosporins, or clindamycin for 3 to 14 days for a variety of infections, and this took place in Shanghai. They excluded recency difficile infection, intestinal disease, and other recent antibiotic use, and they also excluded people who were on immunosuppressive therapy, but they didn't actually specify what that means. So I'm guessing it's going to be people who are on steroids and need anything stronger than that. There were a total of 225 patients enrolled, which boiled down to about 85 patients per group. They were given the trial medication for five days, which is pretty short, following the completion of antibiotics, and they were followed for a total of three weeks after the antibiotics were completed. And I should mention that they began their uh, exposure to the probiotic within 36 hours of starting the antimicrobials, and there are about 50 billion live organisms per capsule. This is uh, table one from the paper, which basically shows that the three arms of the study were randomly distributed and contained a similar baseline of patients and similar antimicrobial exposure in terms of the proportions of um, cephalosporin, penicillins, et cetera. Okay, so here's the actual data. Along the y-axis is the incidence of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and the x-axis holds the placebo group, the low-dose probiotic, and the high-dose probiotic group. And for the people that were getting the placebo, they had about a 44% incidence of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. If they had a low-dose probiotic, it was reduced to 28%. And if they had the high-dose probiotic, it went down more than half to 15%. And what I like about this is not only that we see a, a clear reduction in the incidence of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, but we also see a dose response. If you give more probiotic, you get more of a reduction. And I found that to be compelling. And this was true not only for antibiotic-associated diarrhea, but also for C. difficile diarrhea as a subcategory of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So again, we've got the incidence of C. diff on the y-axis with the three groups here. And again, we see this fantastic dose response. So we go from about 24% incidence of C. diff down to about 1% with the high-dose probiotic. So I think this particular study shows promise, though it's a quite, it's a small group. So let's move on now to actually talking about C. difficile infection. Um, can we use probiotics to prevent primary C. difficile infection? It's difficult to study that question on its own, and most of the time that we see studies that talk about this, it's in the context of the one that I just showed you, where they're really looking at antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and then select as a subgroup or a sub-analysis people that wind up getting C. diff. Can we use probiotics to prevent people from getting recurrent C. difficile infection? In my opinion, which was different from the meta-analysis that was done, I do not feel there's convincing evidence to support the use of lactobacillus rhamnosus GG to prevent recurrent C. difficile infection. There is some evidence in two small randomized control trials that supports the use of using Saccharomyces boulardii to prevent C. difficile recurrences. However, in those studies, the people that were getting the vancomycin were getting two grams of vancomycin a day, which is not our standard of care and in and of itself appears to be associated with a higher risk of recurrence. So, uh, and that's actually evident in the controls for that those two studies because their risk of recurrence in the control groups were 50 and 65 percent. Typically, the risk of recurrent CDI is about 5 to 25 percent. So I think what these investigators may have been studying was the influence of Saccharomyces boulardii to prevent recurrent C. diff in the setting of what is no longer considered to be a standard of care, two grams of P.O. Banco. There's also some safety concerns with Saccharomyces boulardii. According to Lynn McFarland, who's done a lot of these meta-analyses, she wrote in one paragraph in a paper that there's no effect of a normal microbiota in healthy human controls by Saccharomyces boulardii. And like two paragraphs down, she also puts forth the idea that the Saccharomyces is capable of interfering with intestinal pathogens. So I don't know how it is that the Saccharomyces is able to distinguish between friend and foe in the gut, especially when some of us are colonized with things like C. difficile that aren't actually causing a problem. They're just there in us. And that's true for C. diff, for vancomycin-resistant enterococci, for E. coli, for bifidobacterium. 
Unless these are x-ray eyes, I don't know that the saccharomyces is really able to distinguish between friend and foe in our guts. There's also been some reports of fungemia in critically ill patients. And the ones that, were, that wound up being fungemic were people with central venous catheters. They were on enteral feeds, and they had long ICU day, stays, the minimum of which was 23 days. The, re, the report indicated that there was Saccharomyces cerevisiae fungemia, and remember that Saccharomyces cerevisiae and, and Boyardia are close cousins. Um, so outbreak of fungemia affecting at least three patients in an ICU when S. Boyardii powder was being used. And what appeared to happen was that nurses were preparing um, Saccharomyces boyardii at the bedside. They would open up a packet of lyophilized powder, put it into the feed, and get it administered to the patient. Unbeknownst to the people in the ICU, the Saccharomyces was aerosolizing and then going on to cause infection, not just in the patient that was receiving the, the uh, probiotic, but also in their neighbors. So in this setting, in an ICU setting where people have central lines, are on steroids, and are very sick, Lyophilized probiotics are definitely not a good idea. So some alternative treatments that can be used for people with C. difficile infection include fructooligosaccharide, which is a breakdown product of inulin, and the um, FOS should not be lost on anybody here. It's a dietary additive that's generally recognized as safe. It reaches the colon undigested, and it supports the growth specifically of bifidobacteria species. And fructooligosaccharide can be found in everyday foods like bananas and onions and chicory root, as well as in asparagus. So there was a randomized control trial that looked at 142 patients that were, that were diagnosed with C. diff and were receiving standard treatment. And in this case, most of them, uh, over 120, were receiving metronidazole. They are randomized to receive either 12 grams of FOS or sucrose daily as soon as possible after the CDI diagnosis and for 30 days after the cessation of diarrhea, which is a pretty long course to be taking this supplement. They excluded diabetics because they, their placebo was sucrose. They also excluded the immunocompromised, people with known GI disease, and they were able to note throughout the study increased levels of bifidobacterium in the feces of people that were in the treatment arm. So actually giving them the fructooligosaccharide had a specific effect on the gut microflora that was detectable by culture. And they were actually able to demonstrate that they're by giving people the oligofructose, they were able to reduce the recurrence of C. difficile infection. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at the proportion of people without recurrence along the y-axis and time since resolution of diarrhea along the x-axis. The oligofructose group had a recurrence rate of about 8% versus the placebo group, which had a recurrence rate of about 34%. This is still a little bit high for what we expect to see for recurrent C. diff, um, but nonetheless, it did show Overall, I think a convincing reduction in the risk of recurrence for C. diff among the treatment group. A less palatable option for trying to prevent recurrent C. diff or trying to prevent C. diff in, or treat C. diff in general is fecal transplant. There are not yet true randomized control trials or meta analyses, though I, I, what I hear in the rumor box is that there's one underway. Uh, the basic idea is that you take feces from a healthy donor who is should be related to the patient. If not, it should be definitely someone from the same household. And instill by nasal gastric tube or enema the healthy feces into the patient with C. difficile infection. This is not a first-line treatment, but when it's used, it has an 89% cure rate after a single treatment, which is phenomenal and much better than anything else that we have to offer our patients right now. People that required more than one fecal transplant had a 92% cure rate. So this is actually better than all of our other current options, except for the yuck factor, um, which makes all of us in America, um, I think, a little you know, yuck. But uh, it's much more accepted in the European uh, communities. And uh, people are doing this apparently now using capsules. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of that literature come out soon. I haven't seen it published yet, but it's on its way. Okay, so let's move on to a whole other organ. We'll go to the pancreas and talk about pancreatitis. Severe pancreatitis carries with it a 17 to 30 percent mortality, and possible mechanisms among the people that are dying from pancreatitis include small bowel bacterial overgrowth, mucosal barrier failure, inflammatory cascades that get going and get out of control, as well as bacterial translocation. 
So the authors, or the, the, the people doing a study in Holland, asked the question, can probiotics prevent infectious complications of pancreatitis? And to look at this, they uh, enrolled nearly 300 patients with severe pancreatitis, and they were given a multi-species probiotic, or placebo, with enteral feeds BID. And this is a multi-center randomized control trial. And the multi-species probiotic included lactobacillus acidophilus, lactobacillus casei, salivarius, and lactobacillus lactis, as well as bifidobacterium bifidum and bifidobacterium lactis. So I think we're looking at a total of six different strains of bacteria, and it was a total of um, 10 billion bacteria administered each day. So the patients were randomized into two arms, and at baseline, they were a very similar group. The primary endpoint for this study was any infectious complication, and as soon as someone developed an infectious complication, the probiotic was stopped. And the infectious complications included necrosis, bacteremia, pneumonia, urosepsis, and infected ascites. The only one of these where we actually begin to even look at the possibility of statistical significance is affected excites, and I think had there been more numbers here, we would have maybe seen that happen. But in general, as I compare these two columns, the overall percentage of people that developed infected com infectious complications was higher in the probiotics groups, even though we did not see statistical significance. The, the exception here is urosepsis, of which there is one in two patients. The other area where they began to approach but did not reach statistical significance is for a, a trend towards sur more surgical interventions in the probiotics group compared to the placebo group. Otherwise, for the most part, where there are more complications over here, um, there was not a statistical, statistically significant difference between the two groups. So why is a study so important? It's because probiotics actually led to increased mortality in the treatment arm. This is another Kaplan-Meier curve. Mortality is here, and days for randomization are here. Among the placebo group, there is about a 6% rate of death. Among the probiotic group, it was two and a half fold larger at 16%. The After the study was published, there was a lot of um, discussion and criticism in the literature about this particular study because of the high rate of death. And it wasn't about the design, it wasn't about the probiotic, it was mostly about why wasn't the study stopped back here earlier into the trial, why did they wait until actually completing the study. There was an interim analysis, but apparently it wasn't um, comprehensive enough to really pick out the fact that there was a significant difference between the placebo and the probiotic arms. So I think this is a lesson in that we can cause harm with probiotics in a critically ill population, and also that we have to be very, that these interim analyses really do matter and can make a big difference because they may have been able to prevent some of these deaths. So why are probiotics so challenging? It's not entirely clear. I mean, it's, it makes sense. It seems like it's a reasonable approach add good bacteria to our guts and try to have an influence on the health of, of the host. And it's an attractive idea, I think, in general. Part of the reason why this is so difficult to really make happen in the real world is because the human gut is a black box. There are 10 to the 13th or 14th bacteria that live in our intestines. There is an estimated 500 species, many of which we can't grow. If we look at this in terms of metagenomics, which is really a way to look at the, the specific sequences for bacteria, there's over 40,000 operational taxonomic units, which is genomic speak for species. Um, so there's a lot going on here. And so when we try to give somebody a probiotic and give them maybe 10 billion lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which sounds like a lot, we're really giving them 0.1% of the bacteria that's actually in their gut, which is a very small amount. And to put this in perspective, this is like asking the population of the greater Cleveland area, so the Cleveland Elyria mentor region, which is, there's about 2 million of us, to influence every other person in the world, of which there's 7 billion. It's a mighty task. And to ask us to do that without being pathogens, which makes it even more challenging. So can we induce measurable changes in the human gut microbiome? 
at the level of looking at this in terms of sequences and, and uh, metagenomics. There was one study looking at this for probiotics in children. There was no effect. I, did not, I was not able to find any studies where this was described for infections, though I'm sure people are looking at this. But one surefire way to really mess up the gut microbiome is to use antibiotics. And that was shown um, in an interesting fashion by Jacobson et al. in a uh, publication in PLOS 1 in 2010. These were three individuals that were treated with, for Helicobacter pylori infection, so a clear infection, a clear dose and regimen of antibiotic, and a short course. At baseline, all three individuals were predominantly, um, their microbiome was con composed predominantly of the phylum Firmicutes. During antimicrobial treatment, the Firmicutes expanded in two of these patients, but contracted to be replaced by proteobacteria in a third patient. And one year later, the patients had achieved a stable baseline again, still predominated with Firmicutes, but this baseline is different for each of them from where they started. So the antibiotics have a long-lasting effect on the gut microbiome. And this is an example of what I spoke to you about in the beginning of the talk with changes in colonization resistance, and that as we recover from recover from uh, systemic antimicrobials, and we get back our gut microbiome, is different from what it was before. So the answer to this guy as to how do we actually start doing decent probiotic studies and try to figure out what's going on in the gut microbiome is to tell him that he just needs to relax, because <laughs> <laughs> we've got omics technology now. <laughs> Sorry, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so we now have um, omics tools, which we can use to explore the gut microbiome, and I'll explain what these are uh, in, in greater detail. Um, the first being metagenomics, and the one which we're going to focus on today is the use of 16S ribosomal RNA pyrosequencing, and the second of which is metabolomics. And for the work that I'm doing, while I'm collecting samples to look at humans, in the meantime, so I can know how to best utilize those efforts, I'm working with a mouse model so we can actually um, figure out where, where best to focus in, the, in people. So the experiment I want to tell you about is one in which we look at colonization resistance in vivo for mice. We take a bunch of mice and give them clindamycin for three days, which really decimates their gut flora, especially with this anti-anaerobic activity. And then at varying times, after the clindamycin exposure, each, you know, some of these mice in this, as distinct groups are exposed to C. difficile spores by gavage, and then we look for the C. difficile spores in their feces. Mice don't actually get, or don't get sick with C. diff, they get colonized. So at baseline, without antibiotic exposure, the C. diff kind of goes in and goes out, it just passes right through. For mice that are on antimicrobial, we see them get colonized, so you put in some C. diff, you get a lot more out because it's now taken up residence in the gut and is multiplying. And that's what we see here. This is the amount of C. diff recovered in the mouse feces along the y-axis, and here's time across the x. The baseline, the bacteria, the C. difficile goes in and goes out. When the mice are on antimicrobials, they get heavily colonized with C. difficile. But by six days following antimicrobial exposure, they come back to perhaps within the baseline, at least within the era of baseline, though I don't feel that they actually really return to a baseline resistant for colonization resistant, a baseline level for colonization resistance, especially because we see this slight uptick here at 20 days, which uh, we'll come back to in a few more slides. And this blue window here is, is what I want to remind you of is the period during which we see some recovery, at least a partial recovery of colonization resistance. So this held true for C. difficile, and we also looked at this using uh, vancomycin-resistant efficium, or VRE, and here we actually see a return to the baseline resistance uh, within a few days following antimicrobial exposure. So having established this, we next ask the question, what's happening in the gut microbiome over time? So we looked at changes in the gut microbiome associated with the recovery of in vivo colonization resistance by, again, treating mice with th three days of clinda and then collecting their stool over time and analyzing it. And we'll first talk about 16S ribosomal RNA pyrosequencing. sequencing. 
this is the 16S ribosomal RNA is the RNA portion of the 30S subunit for prokaryotic ribosomes, and that's what's shown here in the brown. The sequence that encodes the 16S ribosomal RNA is highly conserved across both bacteria and archaea. And so there's enough variation you can actually sequence these and build a phylogenetic tree. And this helps us look at microbial diversity that's hidden by cultivation methods because we can't grow everything in our guts. And it can also be used to minimize bias and the fact that we're not limited by what we can grow, but we can actually pull out sequences even if we don't know what bug they match to. We know that we've got a sequence that's important, or at least that's, that's there and present and repl replicatable. So this graph shows the baseline composition in terms of phylogenetic groups of the mouse gut microbiome. And this is work that was done um, by myself and our colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Ricky Chen and David Serre. Bacteroidetes comprises the majority of the mouse gut microbiome at 54%. Firmicutes make up about 25%. Unknown bacteria are 17%. Proteobacteria are just 2% of the mouse gut microbiome, and actinobacteria about 1%. And the proteobacteria are going to become important here. And these are the bacteria that I think as prescribers and healthcare workers we're most familiar with because this is what contains E. coli, Proteus, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, Serratia, Shigella, and a number of other organisms which we know about. Um, and Enterobacter is the one that I want you to keep in the back of your head. So this is showing you the same data that I had on the previous graph. It's the baseline composition of the mouse, mu mouse gut microbiome. Over time, when they're on antimicrobials, we see a huge expansion in the proportion of proteobacteria sequences and a contraction of the firmicutes and the bacteroidetes. And then as the mice come off the antibiotics and recover, we see an expansion of the bacteroidetes and of the firmicutes and a contraction of the proportion of proteobacteria to where it really gets back to its baseline by about 12 days. Interestingly, here, at about 20 days after the antibiotics are stopped, the bacteroidetes goes down and the firmicutes proportion increases. And this is that same time period where we saw the uptick in the baseline, in the colonization of C. difficile in the animals. So it might be suggesting that whatever is happening in here that favors the growth of Firmicutes is also favoring the growth of Clostridium in the mouse gut. Clostridium difficile is a member of the Firmicutes phylum. Eventually, at about three weeks, uh, excuse me, close to four weeks after the antimicrobial exposure, we do see what appears to be a stable baseline that's reestablished for the animals. Um, though I'd, I'd like to see what happens as we move further out, but those are future experiments. But it seems that colonization resistance itself is recovered by the time that we're getting a return of a normal proportions of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. I don't know if these are responsible players, I just know that I can see a change in the proportion. So let me move on now to metabolomics. And this is the study of small molecule metabolites. And the idea here is that we're capturing the end product of cellular processes at the level of a cell or of a tissue, or in our case, the community of organisms, that being the fecal microbiome. And I'm going to, this won't be terrible, I promise, in terms of the actual biochemistry, because I struggle with it too. But I'm just going to highlight the pentose phosphate pathway, which you might remember as the hexose monophosphate shunt. Um, the only part that you need to remember is that it's found among um, bacteria in the families Enterobacteriaceae, which are part of the proteobacteria, as well as Enterococcaceae, which are a member of the Firmicutes. And the idea here is for the um, pentose phosphate pathway is that glucose goes to six goes to glucose six phosphate, then to six phosphogluconate, and then from here a carbon is broken off. And there's five carbon sugars that are formed, including ribulose, xylulose, and a whole host of other five carbon sugars. And these will go on to make amino acids as well as um, uh, nucleic acids for other cellular um, needs. And for ribulose, the primary alcohol form of this is ribitol, which is what I'm showing you here in this slide. This shows the relative intensity of ribitol that was detected in mouse feces over time. 
before, during, and then following antimicrobial exposure. For the control animals, it remained fairly steady. For the experimental animals that received the clindamycin, ribitol went way up while they were just after they finished their antimicrobials and then came right back down and hit baseline by about 12 days. The ribitol in and of itself and the other five carbon sugars follow a similar pattern, but that in and of itself is not what I want you to, to take home. What I think is so interesting about this data is that we can actually correlate what's happening at the level of a metabolic product with the phylogenetic changes. So as we see this increase in ribitol is when we also see an expansion of the proteobacteria, and it's the enterococcaceae family within the proteobacteria that are responsible for making a large amount of the ribitol. And as the ribitol goes down and normalizes, it also mirrors what we're seeing with the changes in proteobacteria. So it's not the ribitol itself that's really important. What I think is so cool here is that we can match up metagenomics and metabolomics and start putting some meaning to what's happening in the mouse gut as we recover from antimicrobials. And I hope that we can apply the lessons that we're learning here in mice to what also happens in humans. And that's kind of a tie-in to try to bring back omics and probiotics together. Because the question here is, can we use the metabolic substrates or inhibitors that we typically think about as being drugs and medications to effectively manipulate the gut microbiome so we can actually further human health. And people are starting to do this in a rather crude fashion already. This is work that comes out of Stanley Hazen's group at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. And this is, this is a little bit um, beyond what I'm able to comprehend, but let me see if I can walk you through it. So in general, what they are reporting here is a novel pathway that links dietary, dietary lipid intake with intestinal microflora and atherosclerosis. So people in mice, in the case of their paper, ingest phosphatidylcholine, and that phosphatidylcholine is changed to choline, and then the gut flora can break choline down into this compound trimethylamine. The trimethylamine gets into the bloodstream, uh, into portal circulation, and is taken up by the liver, where flavomonooxygenase is converted to trimethylamine and oxide or TMAO. And TMAO has specifically been linked by this group as being an independent cause for atherosclerotic disease, an independent risk factor for heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death. So what these guys did in mice was decimate the gut floor with antimicrobials, crudely. So they're not after a specific group. They just wiped them all out as much as they could. And they were able to cut down, still fed them a high choline diet, but by cutting out the gut floor, they were able to cut down on the trimethylamine and therefore this TMAO compound. And in a mouse model where they were prone to developing atherosclerotic products, they were able to prevent the formulation of atherosclerosis by inhibiting gut flora, which is pretty cool. We're not ready for prime time yet in humans, but I think this kind of approach shows great promise. And it'll be interesting to see if they're able to target a specific species of bacteria in the gut or if they instead go for some kind of inhibitor that works at this level or perhaps just at this level uh, without actually trying to influence the gut microflora itself. Sorry, so to summarize, probiotics are not medications. Specific probiotics like Saccharomyces boulardii and Lactobacillus GG may confer health benefits to healthy people to prevent travelers and antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Alternative approaches like the fructo oligosaccharide and fecal transplant are potentially viable and safe options for C. difficile infection. And in conclusion, I think we should not, as prescribers, ever prescribe probiotics because they're not medications. This is clearly my opinion. There's a dearth of well-designed probiotic studies, which means this is a great area for opportunity. And I think that we're only just beginning to understand the complex reactions within the gut microbiome. And I think in about 10 years, this is going to be a whole different field and we'll be talking not just about the gut microbiome, but about specific metabolic products from it and how we're going to influence and modify human health. I'd like to thank Curtis Donsky, who's my mentor, as well as Robert Bonomo, Anusha Stiefel, um, my collaborators at the Cleveland Clinic, David Sayre and Ricky Chan, and also the people that work in the lab and do all the glamorous work with the mouse and human feces. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
want to give uh, Robin a double thanks because not only did not only was this a grand round that I solicited that he volunteered for it, and no good deed ever goes unpunished. Then and then you know we had a scheduling conflict with an outside speaker, and so Robin graciously agreed to change the date. So double thanks. Um, so um, if probiotics prevent C diff, pretty relatively effective, but not as good as stool. But if probiotics prevent C diff, why don't we give high risk patients probiotics? And I think some hospitals are doing this. And this is one of the things I heard at IDSA, which intrigued me and prompted me to ask you to give this grand rounds. Mm. I didn't see any literature supporting the use of probiotics mm. being given in high risk patients. And I think yeah. there's actually danger with that because that's the population that may wind up going to the OR for a bowel perf mm. or to have their whole colon taken out. Yeah. Um, and I think that we've shown with the pancreatitis trials that there is the potential for danger there. Yeah. And until we have better safety studies, I, I'm uncomfortable yeah. with it. I, I think there are some, some clinicians in, in who are who, who, not on the basis of randomized clinical trials, I'm not sure saying it's the right thing to do, but I think there are some practitioners who are putting people, you know, if they come in the hospital where there's lots of C. diff spores, we put them on broad spectrum antibiotics, and shockingly, we get lots of C. diff. So I think there are some people who are doing that. Yeah. The country. So, so my approach to that is that we should actually control our use of antimicrobials. Okay. So maybe the fifth day of vancopiptazo for, you know, can't rule out infiltrate is not the best way to approach our patients. I think that would be more effective than giving them more than, than you know, why did she swallow the fly? <laughs> So you think we should take vancomycin out of the admission order set? Is that what you're saying? Um, I thought they came in the same bag. Did, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I, I'll ask one last question then, Dr. Lazarus, but the other thing I, you know, that I heard his presentation, or I, I listened to the, um, the mm -hmm. podcast from IDSA, that, that there are some people who suggest that probiotics may help prevent things outside the gut. That's one thing that really intrigued me, like mm -hmm. people always think about C. diff and diarrhea, but maybe um, hospital-acquired pneumonia, or ventilator-associated pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you came across anything. I, I did come across, the studies are very limited, and it seems to be less about probiotics and more about just reducing the burden of colonization in the mouth. And, and it was, I think the best evidence came from the endotracheal tubes with the inflatable cuff that actually prevented bacteria in your mouth going down into your lungs. That was most effective. Not probiotics and not even CHG, but just the physical barrier uh, with, asper with um, suction of that area on a regular basis, superglottic suction. So what was interesting to me is that when you infect mice with C. they don't get a diarrhea? Right, they so, get colonized. So one of my questions is, Toxin produced in mice. Mm -hmm. one. Yes. Two, why don't they get a diarrhea? And can we can we learn something from that? The fact that even though the toxin is being produced, what, what's going? Why aren't they getting a diarrhea? I don't know. Mice aren't humans, and humans aren't mice. I don't know why they don't get sick. Um, the the original mouse model for C. difficile was hamsters, and they are acutely sensitive to C. diff far more than we are. At baseline, hamsters that have not been exposed to anything that messes up their gut flora, like antibiotics, do not get infected or get sick. But if we expose them to the antimicrobials, as few as 10 spores is enough to make them die. Um, do mice get C. difficile infection? If we mess up their flora well enough, we can actually make them sick. Uh, but I think it's just a reflection of a different gut composition. Pancreatitis tends to be truly you know, a GI problem, but then it can also become a very difficult systemic illness mm -hmm. to, to treat. And there's lots of fluid shifts, lots of acidemia during pancreatitis. It's not like traveler's diarrhea mm -hmm. nor the other conditions. So, you know, I appreciate that the data, you know, looks bad, and you know, there are a lot of issues regarding when the trial uh, should have been called. But on the other hand, it's not, you know, it's, it's, you, you may be comparing apples to oranges. Uh, that child, may, maybe they should have looked at another illness and uh, you know, with that pancreatitis may not have been the best choice. Yeah, their, their specific question was, can you prevent the infectious complications of pancreatitis by adding probiotics? And I think they were hoping to reduce the possibility of but gut translocation. Them, you know, yeah, ab that absolutely. Because that, that, that could have taken, you know, that's a surgical disease at mm -hmm. many times. We have no control over the inflammation in the pancreas. And it's not like the other. Yeah, it's, it is a totally different disease. Yeah. 
beginning you showed some efficacy for preventing Travers diarrhea. Mm -hmm. But you know, Travers diarrhea tends to be self-limited and responds to you know presumptive therapy. So you know having people take a pill a couple times you know probably I mean I don't I don't think that's been embraced in, in practice yet. No, uh, no, I mean. and I, I think. Uh, much as my more pragmatic approach to antimicrobials, I think the better advice to give to travelers is to wash your hands and don't eat raw fruits and vegetables and drink bottled water and other bottled beverages. Oh, but with the fecal transplant thing, maybe we shouldn't wash our hands. <laughs> <laughs> it it yeah. seemed like probiotics were not helpful in, I mean, the biggest problem in C. diff is patients with multiple, multiple recurrences, and probiotics mm -hmm. had no impact on that at all. Right. The fecal transplants <laughs> seem to. Yeah, and it may be the way of the future, as, as yucky as it makes us all respond to it, I think. I'm actually looking forward to trying it, one of my patients, but I haven't had anyone sign up for it yet. I think it's a matter of branding, instead of people transplants, <laughs> you know, human gut microbiome transplant. It sounds, it sounds, uh, it sounds better. Um, any other questions or comments? Again, I want to really thank Robin for, for uh, tackling this, this topic. I think, it's a, I think we're going to hear more about this as, as a future. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.